Well, aloha everyone. Welcome to Hawaii, the state of clean energy. I'm Mitch Ewan, I'm your host today. Uh, my day job, I'm at the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute. Uh, this show is uh, sponsored by the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, who works to uh, identify and support uh, good uh, energy policy for the state of Hawaii. We've been around for about 18 years almost. And we've been involved in many of the uh, really good uh, energy legislation that has been passed over the last 17 years or so. so I'll be talking about uh, Hawaii's uh, hydrogen economy and how we're supporting it. And uh, just so you know, it's the law. So let's start rolling. And uh, I just want to highlight my awesome little logo that we've got here, H2YE, so in case you missed that. and my. Uh, Young uh, tech over on the Big Island uh, did the uh, jazzed up the logo a little bit by adding the Hawaii Islands at the end of the two. If you can just see it there in the green, so he did a great job. So next slide, please. So big question: Why hydrogen in Hawaii? You may ask. So really, in my opinion, everything on the show is my opinion. Is, uh, has the potential to displace imported fossil fuels for transportation and other applications, and use energy applications. So it could be one of the solutions to addressing uh, climate change and also getting Hawaii off fossil fuels and keeping the money in our own economy. We can manufacture it from anything, any of our indigenous renewable energy resources here on the in Hawaii, geothermal, sun, wind, eventually wave energy when it gets there. Biomass is a really good source of hydrogen and others. And what it also brings is energy security to, for Hawaii. Like what happens when the oil tankers stop coming? Um, not because uh, we're, we can totally convert it off fossil fuels, but there's some kind of a glitch in the oil economy whatever, for whatever reason that ship doesn't show up, we're in big trouble because we don't have a lot of stored you know, fossil energy on the islands. And really important, uh, it retains money in the Hawaii economy, which you know, all that oil, we, all that money we export, I have a slide on that, I think, next slide, is uh, exported out of our economy, but if we keep it in our economy, it supports lots of great jobs for you know, Hawaii residents. So that's good for the economy and it's good for the job. So lots of good reasons of why hydrogen in Hawaii. Next slide. So really, um, the point of this slide is to show all the different kinds of vehicles that are currently commercially available that run on hydrogen. And uh, 30 years ago when I got in the hydrogen business, there would have been zero vehicles on that slide that run on hydrogen, except maybe the space shuttle and a few, you know, aerospace applications, but not like we have today. So, uh, but the challenge, what we don't have is we don't have the hydrogen infrastructure to support all those vehicles. So it's sort of like the, the um, vehicle manufacturers are just chomping at the bit to be able to sell their product, but until we have hydrogen infrastructure, you know, they can't do it because if you can't fuel your car, you're not going to buy a hydrogen car. And if it's not convenient, that's also a factor in your decision to buy a hydrogen car. So that's what we're focusing on at HNEI principally is looking at developing, helping to develop the hydrogen infrastructure here in Hawaii. So next slide. So what are the building blocks we need to support this uh, effort? So number one, and I highlighted it in red because it's so important, is we need the political will. We need the political class to jump on board and provide the leadership and uh, take the risks and most of all, uh, gather the resources and set goals and objectives, hold people to that so that we can implement a hydrogen plan for uh, Hawaii. Uh, so out of that political will, and it has to be consistent, it can't be just uh, up and down, oh, we're going to do it for two years and then we stop. It has to be consistent. And the money that comes in also has to be consistent because this is all long-term stuff. So you have to have the right policies and plans, and I'm happy to say, and we'll talk about another slide, Hawaii's done a really good job on putting together hydrogen 
have policies and we are developing plans. Obviously, you have to have the resources. I said before, we have great renewable energy resources here that you can use to make hydrogen. Then uh, I call it a strategic project, like not make work projects or nice to have projects. You gotta have a you know, st strategic uh, imperative in mind. I mean, this project is gonna do this and it's important because of that. Then you have to have your community supporting you because after all, they pay the taxes and they ping on the uh, politicians to say, hey, we want this, Mr. Politician. And we're already seeing that, uh, certainly on the big island. We've got a lot of political support and we've got a lot of community support for hydrogen buses on the big island. We'll talk a little bit about that uh, as we go through. And then you need strategic partners. Uh, here, both here on Hawaii, it'd be great if all the utility companies uh, climbed on board because they could be very, very important strategic partners in supporting it rather than fighting it. Um, and then our uh, suppliers, the people who supply us the equipment, the electrolyzers, the compressors, the vehicles themselves. Like we have, you know, one company, US Hybrid, who is here in Hawaii that's been supporting us for like the last 20 years and a really important uh, partner. And so as the little tagline says at the bottom of the slide, we're, we're doing all six of these in, in a good way. And we've really come a long way in the last uh, 15 years. So roll on to the next slide. So as I said at the opening, you know, it's really important to have the right policies and plans in place to support this effort. I mean, it's a key. So I drew the little, the little key icon on there in case you didn't notice that. Um, but as I said, it's enshrined in the law. It actually says in the Hawaii Revised Statutes that it is Hawaii state policy to establish a Hawaii hydrogen economy. And I don't know of any other state that has that. And that, that was like 10 years ago that was put in place. So really forward thinking. And uh, I'm going to give a, a lot of credit to the legislature at the time uh, who put that in and the continuing legislatures that have kept it on the books. Really important, and that provides consistency because as long as it's on the books, it really helps in your justification when you're rolling out some of these long-term projects where you can point to the statute and say, look, this is actually the law. Now, how well it's implemented and enforced, that's another thing, but at least it's there on the books. So uh, I don't know of anybody else that has that on the books. So, and a lot of people now are looking, a lot of uh, organizations and, and, you know, not Hawaii are, are looking at Hawaii for leadership and lessons learned and how can we do it too. So, next slide. So the uh, program, uh, the overall objective as the top line says, I hate reading slides, but I, you know, I have a poor memory, so I got to use them as a crutch is really a transition the state to a renewable hydrogen economy. And it's, that, it's getting that infrastructure in place, as I said, is the key element because the vehicle manufacturers, they've got it nailed down now. And so, I mean, I can go here in Hawaii and on Oahu to the Toyota dealership at Servco, and they're actually leasing uh, hydrogen vehicles, the Mirai, it's an awesome car. Uh, they have their own hydrogen station there so they can support it. Um, and it's a really great deal uh, as far as a lease rate because you get the car, you get all your maintenance for three years, and you get all your hydrogen for three years. Just for the low, low price of whatever it is. I don't know what it is today, so I don't want to you know, put a false number out there. But go down and talk to the people at Servco and take it for a test drive. It's really an awesome car. Uh, you'd be really impressed. So, you know, we have to do all the normal stuff. We have to do our strategic R&D, which is what we do at h &E We test stuff. I mean, people, you know, salespeople come along and say, God, my electrolyzer, my compressor is the best thing since sliced bread. It won't rust. Not even the salt air environment, guaranteed. And uh, we put it out there at places like the Marine Corps base and at Nelha, and lo and behold, we find out a lot of rough things that do rust, you know, because they just, uh, like, they're just trying to make the sale, so they gloss over the fact that the, the guy in the shop putting it together just picks out the non-stainless steel bolt to do something out, because it's easy for them. So we need to jump on them and make sure they enforce uh, QA and that uh, 
I'm just using that as an example because you know it's it's really expensive to change out equipment that rusts out. And the Marine Corps base, I have a station there. You wouldn't believe the uh, the level of rust that we've encountered. A, le a level of corrosion is really a wide, uh, eye opener. Even the guys from Toyota, you know, corporate, were amazed. They said, "Wow, this is unreal." So we do that kind of stuff. Uh, obviously, uh, when we're running these systems, we take data on how well they do engineering or technical-wise, uh, how they perform, and then also uh, how much they cost, A, to buy, and then B, to maintain. Because, you know, when things rust through, you got to change parts, uh, you got to bring people in to do maintenance on it. Sometimes the uh, expertise is not available here in Hawaii, so you got to bring a guy in from the mainland. So, you know, you have to pay his travel time, his air time, his hotel, his local transportation, plus his time when he's actually doing the work, and then you have to pay for him going back home. So that all adds up, and uh, so obviously we want systems that you don't have to bring the guy out from the mainland. We want to have our own people here in Hawaii who know how to do it. So we just have to bring him in from Mililani or from Campbell Industrial Estate to fix your compressor, for example. So uh, we want to look at uh, how uh, electrolyzers and hydrogen systems can support the reliability of our grid, either through backup power or like as a as a variable load, and, um, and also for security projects to increase the uh, penetration of a renewable energy so that we don't have to rely on that ship coming in. And we also do the demonstration projects, you know, because, uh, you know, like I said, we're gathering all this equipment, we're putting it together, we're putting it out there on the field, how well does it work? And it also gives us an a, 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 a opportunity to do outreach and demonstrate it to our local population, the local taxpayers, and give them the experience of, you know, why should we have this here in Hawaii? Wow, this is a great Mirai vehicle. I'd really like to have one. Where do I get the hydrogen for it? So, um, and then, of course, we're also promoting uh, our renewable resources to uh, investors who can come in and say, gee, if I put up this big uh, PV array, I can be making electricity, maybe I can make hydrogen with it. Or a wind turbine, I can be, maybe if it's dedicated purely to hydrogen, I can you know, find a way to do that. Also, uh, new legislation that came out, uh, thanks to Riley Sato of the County of Hawaii, uh, um, R&D department, uh, it's a, a transportation services uh, contracting has now been approved for the counties so that private industry can come in and supply the buses and all the infrastructure and they charge a usage fee like a, you know, so much per vehicle mile traveled or per passenger mile traveled. Great innovative program that nobody else is doing, and this is going to be really good for the uh, good old US of A on the mainland as well. Next slide. So one of the uh, legislations uh, that the Hawaii Energy uh, Policy Forum helped to implement or, or bring to life was uh, the formation of the Hawaii Hydrogen Implementation Working Group. So when I originally, uh, uh, wrote the Hawaii Hydrogen Plan, I put in there a, this working group idea to help coordinate all the various departments in making sure that we try to knock down any of the barriers or the speed bumps to implementing uh, hydrogen and also to keep the legislature and the, go and the governor and, and his staff informed on the progress, where the holes are and where we need help. And so, uh, so that was uh, headed up by HCAT, uh, General Stan Osserman, who unfortunately for us, and maybe fortunately for him, he's just retired like last month. So we've got to rejuvenate that. But it was established by the legislature. Like I said, it coordinates the Hawaii Hydrogen Program. All the major stakeholders are represented, the government, industry, academia, meaning like academics, like UH. Reports to the legislature, the meetings are open to the public, so we exercise the sunshine law. And uh, right now, it really needs, in my opinion, it needs a rep from the governor's office to provide a little bit more authority. Originally, in my, in my um, hydrogen plan, I called it the Hawaii Hydrogen Authority. And uh, nobody liked that word, authority. So 
it was much easier just to say implementation working group so that, you know, they didn't have to uh, have somebody imposing something on them. Although I still think that's a good idea and we should make it an authority so that, you know, a referee listens to everybody, then he makes, helps make the decision, blows his whistle and says, that's it, got it, we're off. This is what we're going to do. I like authority. Now, we have to make a break. The authority running this show says, I need to come in for a short commercial. So we'll be back in one minute. Aloha, I'm Winston Welch, host of Out and About. It's a show that we have every other Monday on Think Tech Live here. We explore a variety of topics that are really interesting. We explore organizations, events, and the people who fuel them in our city, state, country, and world. We've got some amazing guests on here, like all the shows at Think Tech. So if you want to catch up on stuff, tune into my show every other Monday and other shows here on Think Tech Live. It's a great place to learn about stuff, to be informed. And uh, if you have some ideas, come on my show. Let's talk about it. See you later and aloha. Aloha. I'm Keisha King, host of At the Crossroads, where we have conversations that are real and relevant. We have spoken with community leaders from right here locally in Hawaii and all around the world. Won't you join us on thinktechhawaii.com or on YouTube on the Think Tech Hawaii channel. Our conversations are real, relevant, and lots of fun. I'll see you at the crossroads. Aloha. So we're back. We're live at Hawaii, the state of clean energy. And look at all that clean energy out here uh, behind me. That's all kind of wave energy. There's sun energy there. And I bet if we whip, put a wind turbine, we'd never be able to get it approved. But there's lots of wind there, too. So there's an example, and, and of course, we're looking at a bunch of hydrogen in there. Of course, it's, you know, it's connected to oxygen, in the, which is water. And so uh, we need to be able to split that uh, hydrogen off all that water you see in the background. And all my classmates up in Canada eat your hearts out. So anyway, let's uh, carry on with the next slide. I don't want to run out of time. So a little bit about, I want to talk a little bit about our resources. So we'll move on to the next slide. So, and by resources, uh, in this case, I'm not talking about the energy sources. I'm talking about money. <clears throat> because money makes this stuff go. You can't, you can't do it on air, and you can't do it on vaporware. Eventually, you've got to stand up to the plate, and you've got to actually spend some real money on it. So I remember a uh, speaker say, you know, we had a meeting about 10 or 11 years ago, during the summer break, and he went around the table and asked everybody what they needed, and I put my hand up bravely and said, we need money, speaker, and we need real money, you know, in the million dollar range. Up till now, we've been able to do these little projects through creative accounting or whatever you want to call it, you know, fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000. I know that probably sounds like a lot of money to some people out there, but you get these big projects, these multi-million dollar projects, in here, we have to come up with our cost share. And the cost share could be one or two million dollars to leverage, you know, four or five million dollars. So for a total pot of maybe six or seven million dollars. So we can't do that on just like vaporware. At the end of the day, you have to have cash because you actually have to buy things and you actually have to pay for people, for engineering, and all the things you have to do. So they formed a out of that, they formed the Hawaii Investment Capital Special Fund, which was really innovative. And I don't think anybody else has done that once again. This was world-leading stuff. And we did this 10 years ago. And they put uh, $10 million into that fund. So if you look at it on a per capita basis, say, say Hawaii, let's round numbers so I don't have to do any special math. Like, we have a million residents here in Hawaii. Compared to California, which has 30 million residents. So if you do it on a per capita basis, that, that was a, like equivalent to a $300 million deal. Um, if, if you looked, if you kind of compared it to the population. So that was, that was a big investment. And so what they were going to do with that is, is first of all, to, to 
Like I said, cost share of this federal uh, money, um, the research money where we needed the cost share. Um, and also, the, they wanted to uh, look at um, uh, funding uh, startups and good ideas. And so uh, the source of the funds was the legislature. Uh, right now, it is, uh, but anybody can contribute. So any of you very wealthy individuals out there who want to make a, a, a contribution, please contribute to the Hawaii investment, uh, Hydrogen Investment Capital Special Fund. Never happened, but you don't ask, you don't get. So next slide, please. Well, as I said, uh, funded at $10 million. I won't read through the whole thing. Uh, basically, the fund has now been uh, depleted. All the funds have been dispersed. Uh, a lot of the uh, infrastructure projects I, I've been working on were beneficiaries of that fund, and we used it to leverage quite a lot of federal money. Um, it also went to support uh, Hawaii Volcano National Park, uh, supported their bu hydrogen bus. Um, Little update on that, uh, because of the eruption, uh, the two buses that were going to be deployed at the uh, Hawaii Volcano National Park um, are, have now been transferred over uh, to the county of uh, Hawaii, the Big Island bus. So they will now have three hydrogen buses. I could call that a fleet of buses. And so uh, h &I will be supporting that, uh, providing the uh, hydrogen and uh, all the technical support to help them uh, run that. So um, they also, as I said, they made like kind of venture capital investments, like they made an investment in Pacific Biodiesel uh, to help them with their biodiesel plant uh, over on the uh, Big Island. And that was a big help. And they're still in business and doing well. Um, and that's it for now. I just want to cut to the next one. So the other sources of resources, i.e. money, is the barrel tax. So as you can see, that was enacted in 2010. It's $1.05 per barrel of oil. And uh, generates about $30 million a year, approximately. That's what that little wiggly sign means. And 60% of it goes to the general fund. So the legislature at the time, that's when Hawaii was pretty, in pretty bad financial shape. So they hived off the 60%. It was all supposed to go uh, to uh, uh, renewable energy, energy uh, projects pretty well, although some of it went to the oil spill uh, cleanup fund, state energy office, Department of Ag, and some of it went to h &E In fact, we've used some of that, our barrel tax money to fund the, uh, the bus uh, for the, uh, um, the, the county of Hawaii, the Big Island bus system. So they, that their third bus is uh, one that was purchased out of barrel tax money. It's a beautiful bus. 20, I, mean, I think I have a picture in one of my next slides. Or the next show, I'll for sure have it. Um, and uh, right now, uh, we need some more money to replenish that fund. And uh, so that's one of the asks uh, that I think we're going to be asking for in this uh, legislative session. So, next slide. So, one of the things is, uh, as I said earlier, you can't just do um, projects for the sake of doing a project just to keep researchers employed. There has to be a strategic uh, need for it. So. You know, the, the programs have to be seen as being uh, cost effective, you know, providing effective solutions for the, uh, the tax paying public. You know, what's the benefit of that to the, the uh, general public? Why should I be doing this? Well, in this case, you know, by looking at the hygiene infrastructure and the public transportation, um, that's helping us transition to this uh, hydrogen economy. Uh, non-fossil fuel economy and demonstrating it to the public and allowing the public to actually ride in one of these vehicles because they can take the bus. These things will be used in you know, revenue service on the Big Island. These projects, you know, we're competing for scarce resources. I mean, there's just not a lot of money just lying around. So we have, that's why we have to make our case. And uh, you know, we have to have a long-term you know, strategy versus just like I said, some short-term make work project. And then we need success stories. Like once we accomplish something, we need to tell everybody. Like the technology's been validated, hey, it's affordable, and then we need champions. And that's starting to happen now on the Big Island on, in the hydrogen scene. So the city, the, the county council is really stepping up to the plate um, in supporting this, both with policy and eventually, I hope, uh, with, uh, with uh, funding. Uh, 
basically rejuvenate their whole bus system, which is based on diesel engines. Out of 65 buses they're supposed to have, they only have nine buses on the road belonging to the county, and then they, they're, they're renting buses from Roberts to fill in the, uh, the schedule. And so they don't have a legacy system. Those buses, even the ones they have on the road, are old and pretty well worn out. Most of them are. There may be a couple of newer ones. And so the idea is to look at replacing them with uh, zero emission buses. So, um, and some of those could be hydrogen. Some of those could be battery electric buses. Of course, I'm pushing the, the hydrogen bus. But we need the champions. But, you know, we in the research community, and we, we need to come up with winning projects as well. I mean, you know, we need to show success that this has been a worthy investment. Next slide. Uh, one of the things we did uh, both on Oahu and on the Big Island is, you know, we need to get the first uh, responders on board, you know, our firefighters, um, because like it says, the name says, they're the first responders. And so when we're looking to get systems permitted and uh, looking at safety and all that kind of stuff, uh, the first thing the permitting guys do is they turn to the fire chief and say, is this okay? You know, is this safe? Because, you know, the, the permitting guys are really dedicated to safety. Um, that, they take that on as their mission, and, and, and they're very, very careful. And the rules and regulations and the codes and standards are like a book about that thick. It takes a lot of work to plow your way through it. So if you get the first responders on board, and they can tell the, the planner, the, uh, the permitting guys, yeah, this is okay, we've checked it out, uh, it works, uh, we're, we're comfortable with it, then that makes it much easier for that uh, permitting guy to sign off on your permit. So we uh, trained uh, over 300 first responders, about 150 on each island. Uh, it was both classroom and field work. And you see some of the pictures we took out there in the field where they had this fake car. It was all like, you know, stainless steel car with a dummy in it, <laughs> a real dummy. And uh, then they'd have hydrogen and or natural gas or, uh, you know, um, propane um, piped into the car. And they'd look at the difference between the, the two types of fires and then how you address it. And then a lot of the uh, classroom time was focused on electric vehicle stuff. Like what wires do you have to cut? Let's say a car is turned over or it's totally wrecked. So you can get the people out of the car, but you don't want to electrocute either the first responder or the person in the car. So uh, you know, about 60% or more of the program was just involved in an electric vehicle, whether it's a battery electric vehicle or a hydrogen vehicle. It didn't matter because a hydrogen is an electric vehicle and it does have batteries. We want to have batteries on a hydrogen car because we have to have a place to put the regenerator braking in there. Well, that's it. I'm, you know, and the fire department really loved it. Uh, they thought it was great, and they're pretty comfortable with it. We need to do another series of these uh, uh, tests or, or, or uh, training sessions with them to refresh, uh, refresh it. Um, but that's the show for today, and uh, I will continue doing hydrogen shows uh, as uh, we go along so that uh, I can roll it out in biteable bites and not try to overwhelm you. And um, so that's it for today. We'll be back uh, next Wednesday. And uh, not sure who we're going to have. Uh, if I can't get some other uh, person to come on and talk about their project, then I'm going to talk about hydrogen some more. So you're on notice. So anyway, thank you very much. And until next Wednesday, aloha.